Hello, I'm Brett Boggs, Superintendent of the Tippecanoe Valley School Corporation. On Thursday, September 13th, the Tippecanoe Valley School Corporation began a two-day process of honoring our third class of Tippecanoe Valley High School Distinguished Alumni. Distinguished alumni are Valley graduates, living or deceased, who have led successful lives while making substantial contributions to their chosen field of work or have provided outstanding service to their community, state, or country. The class of 2012 consists of nine Valley graduates from the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s. The nine inductees into the class of 2012 were honored with a formal dinner held at Tippecanoe Valley Middle School. Following the dinner, the inductees were introduced and interviewed by local radio personality, Rita Price. Each inductee also uh, introduced and spoke of the Tippecanoe Valley educator that had the greatest impact on their life. Induction Day activities followed on Friday, September 14th at Tippecanoe Valley High School. The day opened with a welcome breakfast at which the inductees were introduced to the student liaison that would accompany them throughout the day. Each inductee then made four presentations to groups of freshmen through seniors, in which they shared their high school, career, and life experiences. They proved, or excuse me, this proved to be a beneficial time for the students of Tippecanoe Valley High School as they learned about the outstanding accomplishment of these distinguished individuals. The students realized earning a diploma from Tippecanoe Valley High School was an important initial step in the success of each inductee. The inductees were then given a tour of the school, followed by lunch, where the inductees were available to speak with individuals or small groups of students. Induction day concluded when the inductees into the Tippecanoe Valley High School Distinguished Alumni Class of 2012 were introduced at halftime of the home football game. A brief biography of each inductee was read aloud as a beautiful commemorative plaques were presented. Nominations are being accepted for the Tippecanoe Valley High School Distinguished Alumni Class of 2013. Anyone who would like to submit a nomination may obtain a nomination form from any Tippecanoe Valley school, the administration office, or the Tippecanoe Valley website at www.tvsc k12.in.us. Finally, I would like to thank RTC's Scott Sager for conducting and recording the interviews of our distinguished alumni. The Tippecanoe Valley School Corporation appreciates our strong partnership with the Rochester Telephone Company and the support RT RTC provides our schools and community. Now it's time to meet the members of the Tippecanoe Valley High School Distinguished Alumni Class of 2012. Chris Griffiths. Chris is the first posthumous nominee for inclusion in Valley's Distinguished Alumni. He died September 12, 2011, at the age of 45. Graduating from TVHS in 1984, Chris earned a business degree in mechanics administration from Lincoln Tech. A highly successful team manager in Firestone Indy Lights Racing, Chris guided the Sam Schmidt Motorsports Indiana Lights team to 46 wins and 4 championships. He also had worked with Schmidt's Indianapolis 500 drivers the past 3 seasons. Chris began his IndyCar career at Patrick Racing in the 1980s when he worked with Gordon Johncock and Emerson Fittipaldi. Chris was on Fittipaldi's team when he won the 1989 Indianapolis 500. In 1990, he joined Chip Ganassi Racing and in 1993 moved to Bernstein Racing where he stayed until 2002. In 2003, he served as the crew chief for Panther Racing's Mark Taylor who won the Indy Lights Championship. Chris joined Sam Schmidt Motorsports in 2004. Chris was a great individual with a tremendous amount of integrity and a hard work ethic, said Sam Schmidt. I didn't hire him for what he said in the interview because he never said much. I hired him because of the massive amount of respect and admiration people had for him in the paddock. One thing for sure is, 
We wouldn't have any trophies in the case at the shop without him. I'm Ryan Anglin. I graduated Tippecanoe Valley in 2004. My name is Nathan Strohshaw and I graduated from Tippecanoe Valley High School in the year 2000. My name is Matt Holt. I graduated in 1976. Hi, I'm Terry Whitaker and I graduated in 1998. Uh, my name is Andy Noop and I graduated in 1977. Terry Wagamuth Johnson and I graduated in 1979. First class to go four full years. Sure, my name is Ellen Burge and I graduated in 1988. My name is Sherry Reese Durkis, and I graduated in 1998. My most memorable moment at Tippy Valley, uh, I think, would be when I was a junior, um, actually cut in front of uh, somebody in the lunch line, and then I ended up uh, marrying her uh, seven years later. So. Uh, I don't have one specific most memorable moment. Uh, it's just the whole memory of high school is a fond memory of getting to spend time with people I became great friends with and we've got to see how all of us have grown up and matured and moved on with our lives. I think actually my most memorable moment was coming here the first day when it opened. So uh, I was not in the first graduating class but uh, my middle of my junior year was when we moved here and I think that probably has to stand out as the most memorable moment that I have of my time here. Um, my most memorable moment was actually probably graduation day. Um, it was pretty surreal to be there in that room and getting ready to receive your diploma and um, you know just knowing that there was a world of possibilities in front of me and my life was just beginning. Well, it, it's, it's a little difficult because there's been a lot of memorable, memorable moments. I think probably I'm going to go with the idea that I was one of the original uh, football players for the school. Um, I remember ninth grade, they, they had a call of students that were interested in being on the team, and I'd always wanted to play, but I had never played a single organized game of football until, and I don't think any of us had until ninth grade. Uh, some of us were a little bit older, and we went out and uh, taught each other how to put the uniform on, you know, uh, just really didn't know what we were doing, but I, I knew that I was at the start of something that was pretty important, uh, at least to me. And I remember the first game, we, we didn't know where to stand. We didn't know how, what, the, what, what the order was of events, but uh, I felt we, we went out and did the best we could and uh, started, I think, a, a rich tradition of, of Valley football that has, has kind of persisted to date. So but it's, it's a little source of pride to know that I was one of the first ones on the field, and I think that was pretty memorable. I have a lot of memorable moments, and um, when I was thinking about this, even though it didn't turn out the way that we wanted it to, I was on the um, runner-up sectional team in 1978 when we lost in double overtime to Warsaw, who then went on and won the state. So many of us feel that that was actually the state championship game that year in 1978. Um, we had a lot of fun playing and we were just sorry we didn't get down to Indianapolis. It's hard to pinpoint just one moment, but um, I think for me, I remember laughing a lot. I remember my friends and the activities I was involved with and, and we're just really enjoying that. And I remember our class. Um, we had a really good class. We were kind of known as a good class coming up 1988. And um, we seemed, at least from my perspective, to kind of um, blur those boundaries between the cliques. And we were an inclusive class, and that, that suited me. I think my memories came from homecoming and the spirit weeks that we would have. There was always a good time, and everybody kind of pulled together to just here on our school. Academically, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I definitely enjoyed running track and cross country uh, for four years. Uh, I'd say that would be my uh, favorite part of high school, but uh, I definitely enjoyed Spanish class, yeah. Uh, the thing I enjoyed most as a student here at Tippecanoe Valley High School was all the extracurricular activities I was able to participate in. I was on the football team, the wrestling team, and I was able to be in the drama and musical clubs and also in the French clubs. So those activities outside of class are what I enjoyed the most.
looking back, what I enjoyed the most were the friends that I had. Uh, some of them are gone now, actually, uh, but the people that I sort of grew up with. And we all went our separate ways, but many of us, uh, in our own way, became successful and happy and productive people. Um, I really loved art when I was here and um, really loved art class. I took a lot of art classes. Um, and then who doesn't love study hall? So. so somebody said earlier, just the extracurricular activities. I think in a small community like this, everyone kind of has to do their share as far as uh, you know, being in the band and, and helping with this and doing that and, and it builds a sense of community and, and I think it kind of gives everybody the opportunity to participate and contribute and there's a shared responsibility and I think that's really important. My extracurricular activities, I participated in um, sports, volleyball, tennis and basketball and just that working with a team and um, the friends, different friends that you meet through all those different activities. That was truly an enjoyable time in my life. Well, in addition to the activities, I was a cheerleader and a swimmer and, and various clubs and stuff. But I think academically, what I really enjoyed is um, the teachers that really took the time to get to know the students and had a sense of humor, um, but also had high expectations and, and clear expectations. I love being challenged. So I liked the science and, you know, the things that make you think outside the box was my, my specialty. So I loved being pushed constantly to learn new things. After I graduated high school, uh, I went to Vincennes University very shortly. And then uh, actually I went to the Navy for five years. And now I am back in school at IPFW. I'm majoring in biology right now, uh, back in school after uh, five years as a Navy rescue swimmer. So uh, that kind of led into what I do now, which is uh, I'm an advanced EMT and uh, firefighter in Huntington, Indiana. Uh, I think I've always been uh, drawn to uh, medical things and, uh, I don't know, uh, rescue situations, I guess. I've always kind of wanted to be a part of that. Uh, the most challenging aspect of my career, I guess, would uh, having to be flexible and always thinking on your feet. You know, it's very dynamic. You never know what's going to happen, so you just have to be prepared as best you can and kind of roll with it. After I graduated, I went to Vincennes University for two years where I studied aviation. And then after that, I continued on to Purdue University where I finished my bachelor's degree also in aviation. Uh, my career path, I started flying when I was 16 years old. So that led to uh, my love of aviation and why I went to study that in school. Uh, when I graduated from Purdue, I decided to go into the military because you can only do this type of flying once in your life. You can fly commercially anytime you want after you get out of the military, but I can only have the experiences that the Air Force offered just once. And I also wanted to go to the Air Force to serve my country. Both of my parents were first generation, were immigrants, so I was first generation American citizen. It is an opportunity for me to pay back a country that gave me the opportunities I have. The most challenging aspect of my career is the sacrifice of time that I give up serving the country. Uh, over the past four years, I've mess, missed every Christmas and Thanksgiving. Uh, so missing things like that is probably the most challenging aspect of my career and being away from friends and family. After a year's absence from school, after I first graduated, I went to Purdue. Uh, and I started there in the fall of 1977. And I graduated in 1981 with an uh, undergraduate degree in agricultural economics. And I, in 1983, I stuck around and got a master's degree. Uh, from there, I went on to the University of Missouri. And I was there for four years and got my uh, PhD there in 1987. So that, that was the end of my formal education. Um, before I even graduated from the University of Missouri, I moved to Iowa State in 1985 with my advisor. So I'd finished all my coursework and had passed all my qualifying exams and um, moved up to Iowa State where I did what was called a pre-doc or pre-doctoral uh, studies. And essentially what that meant was I was paid to stay there and uh, uh, work on my dissertation, which was a pretty good deal. Then I spent another year there as a postdoc. From there, I went on to the University of Wisconsin for six years. I started there as an assistant professor in 1988. And uh, 
was promoted to an associate professor after four years. Stayed there until 1994 when I moved to uh, North Carolina State. And there I joined the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics and was there for five years. Um, left for one year to move to University of Arizona where I took an endowed chair position. But it turned out um, it was expedient for me to move back to North Carolina State. My wife was finishing a PhD in economics at North Carolina at the time. So back I went, spent another four years. Then my wife and I both took jobs at uh, Purdue in the Agricultural Economics Department in 2006. And we left in 2010 uh, because we had a good opportunity to move to the University of Alabama where we are now. And I'm there in the Department of Economics, Finance, and Legal Studies where I uh, am a professor and Dwight Harrigan, faculty endowed chair of natural resource economics. Say that 20 times real fast. The funny thing is the line of work that I'm in, it, you don't so much choose it as it kind of chooses you. Um, and so I don't know of too many people that do what I do to sort of set off as, as freshmen in college and said, I'm going to be a professor somewhere. Uh, what kind of happens is that you kind of find you have a knack for doing nerdy type stuff. And you don't mind sort of, you know, learning a lot about very arcane things. And, and um, it takes a little bit of obsessive compulsive personality disorder to do what I do. You have to uh, be willing to get very obsessed about minor details and things like that. And so it all sort of fit my, uh, my personality. And I think that the thing that made me interested in economics to begin with was that I grew up here on a farm uh, during the previous commodity price boom in the 1970s. And, you know, I'd watched my father kind of struggle trying to figure out how to um, take advantage of some of the price opportunities and so forth that came along during that period of time. And I think like many people, he wasn't necessarily so successful at gaming the market. In fact, maybe rather the opposite. And so it sort of launched me on a lifelong mission of trying to uh, see if I couldn't untangle some of the mystery behind some of these things. And after a lot of study, I've concluded that no, you can't do it. You know, the most challenging aspect of my career has probably changed through time. Um, you know, I, I'm not a young guy, so I, I think I'm the oldest guy here. I'm 54, and I started in the line of work I'm in, officially started it in 1988, but was really sort of working up to it before then. And when you're starting out in my line of work, the most challenging part is sort of to establish yourself professionally. And that means that you have to really sort of prove to people that you have something on the ball. And it's sort of like, um, I suppose, sort of like in the old days, the uh, people that collected scalps to prove that they were uh, you know, capable of doing those sorts of activities. And so that was the first sort of challenge. And I think through time, the challenges change. When you get to my age, um, there, there's, at some point mid-career, the challenge becomes staying on top of the game. Because science, the, the kind of discipline that I'm in, and any discipline for that matter, it changes so quickly. And the kinds of things you need to know, the kind of knowledge and skills you need to have, whatever you knew five years ago, isn't necessarily relevant today. Then you start to reach the age where you realize at some point, none of us are going to stay ahead of the curve. We're all going to slip down the other side of the hill. And I'm maybe about there now, I'm not quite sure. But um, I think the most challenging thing now is to sort of figure out how I can help other young people that are coming up in my line of work to try to help them to achieve their success and have their moment of glory, perhaps. I went to school uh, first at IPFW in Fort Wayne, and I started out with graphic design as a major. And then I moved on, uh, took a couple years off, and uh, got a little older and wiser and decided to change my major to social work. And so I returned to college and uh, about 2004 and went to Ball State. I majored in social work. I did a lot of um, activities with um, disability awareness activities on campus and, and that kind of stuff. I'm currently employed at Accessibility Center for Independent Living. Um, it's a not-for-profit in Indianapolis, and we serve people with disabilities, um, all disability types, all age ranges. Um, I do. A, I never know what I'm going to be doing in the day. It's it's always something different, and I work specifically uh, with youth in helping them achieve their goals towards uh, becoming more independent.
Um, I think it was because I had been helped so much along the way. Um, I've been blessed to have a lot of people come into my life that have given me a hand up in achieving my goals and my dreams. And, um, you know, I think when I got older and just some of that youth wears off a little bit and you start thinking more about what you want to give back to the big picture and what you want your legacy to be, um, I decided that I, you know, I wanted to give back. I wanted to help other people and help them accomplish their dreams. The most difficult part is, um, you know, really caring about the people that you work with and uh, the people that you're serving and doing your best to try to assist them. But sometimes you run into brick walls, um, either from attitudes or just not enough resources being out there and you have to leave and go home at the end of the day knowing that you weren't able to help that person. Uh, right after graduating, I attended Huntington College, which is now Huntington University in Huntington. And it was uh, close enough to be uh, where I could travel back and forth, but not so close that you know I felt like I wasn't going away to college. So I, I, I stayed there for four years, graduated with a degree in business. And I'm a very non-traditional student, so I spent the next seven years working uh, before I went back to school at Butler University for my master's degree in marriage and family therapy in 1989. I was non-traditional again, went back to the workforce for several years, and then uh, traveled to Columbia, Missouri, attended the University of Missouri, got my PhD in psychology in 2003. The first work stint that I had, I was a youth minister at a church in Kokomo, Indiana. And uh, there were, I enjoyed that. Uh, and keep in mind, I had a business degree. And so I really felt unprepared for a lot of the uh, counseling type issues that, that families and the youth of the church were coming to me with, things that I really didn't feel prepared to answer. So I actually started getting into the psychology field as a result of that, I went back to get my master's degree so I could help uh, address some of those questions. Found out that it really closely matched my personality, and I found out that that's really kind of what I wanted to do. And so from that point on, it just kind of spurred uh, a roller coaster as far as getting into the field, getting more advanced, and kind of developing some expertise that I thought would be beneficial. What is most challenging is in some ways the most rewarding as well. Um, as a psychologist, I, I see clients that uh, have had concerns kind of evolving to the point that they're very, their lives become very dysfunctional and, and sometimes they have difficulty doing things that other people don't have difficulty doing. And so I think the rewarding part is that they reach out for help and I feel like I, I do my best to help them. So that to me is very rewarding that they trust me with that level of confidence. I think the challenging part is that I'm not always able to do what I feel is most beneficial and that sometimes those situations don't get better despite good efforts of, of well-meaning people. And so I, I still sleep really well, but there are times when I, that's very rewarding to me and there's times when that's very challenging because sometimes you just want it to happen a little bit differently. Um, I went to International Business College and graduated with an associate degree in accounting and then I most recently finished my bachelor degree in management from Indiana Wesleyan in 2011. Accounting was, has been the basis of everything that I've done and it's opened many doors for me. So I was just glad that I found that out, that it was a gift. I started out in Fort Wayne, moved to Decatur, Illinois in accounting clerk positions and then came back home and in 1985 my parents asked me if I would like to come to work for them um, in our family business and so I began there um, set up the accounting system for our business Akron Concrete Products that my grandfather started in 1928 and then um, actually purchased it from my father along with my brother and brother-in-law in 1990 and so I was at Akron Concrete for 11 years as co-owner. And during that time, I was able to, um, I was asked actually by Marvin Gagnon, I'll never forget the day he came down and he said, Terry, he said, there's something going on over at Rochester. Would you go over and find out how to get some money for Akron? And that began my um, volunteer career on the Community Foundation. I was one of the charter members of the Fulton County Community Foundation um, 
And that was something that I just fell in love with. And as it turned out, when I left Akron Concrete Products, um, a year later, they asked me to come be the executive director. And it, here again, it was because of my accounting degree that they asked me to come. And so I've been there now for 10 years. Um, I'm the executive director of the Northern Indiana Community Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that works with donors to build endowments that benefit our communities. So um, we grant dollars to many local projects here in Fulton County. We also serve Miami and Stark counties. Doors open, when a door closes, a window opens, and that's kind of how my career happened. I never dreamed I would be here. So I guess it goes back to um, mine where it wasn't like Andy, where it was next steps, it was more next opportunities. I'd say time management. I, I just want to help everybody, and um, there's just not enough hours in the day to be able to do that. So really just being able to manage my time and make sure that the time that I spend is where it needs to be spent and helps as many people as possible. So after I graduated from Tiffany Valley, I went to Defiance College in Defiance, Ohio, and I was there for four years and received a degree in elementary education with a concentration in sociology and psychology. And when I traveled abroad and began my teaching career, I got my master's from Framingham State University in Massachusetts and also an educational leadership certificate from SUNY in New York. Most recently, I received a certificate from the Center of Right Relationship, a, a certificate in organizational and relationship systems coaching. So after college, I took my first teaching job in Houston, Texas. And I taught for four years in the South, in Houston and New Orleans, teaching elementary school. And then I took off and I taught in Asuncion, Paraguay, Warsaw, Poland, and Bangkok, Thailand, um, all at the elementary school level. And in between Poland and Thailand, I also taught at the university level in Chicago at DePaul University for two years in the teacher education department. So I was working with student teachers and also teachers at the beginning of their program, learning to become teachers. Um, that's a good question and I've thought a lot about this and I think at the time, I don't know that I gave it a lot of conscious thought. Um, I knew that I wanted to work with people. I considered something in sociology. Uh, teaching seemed accessible to me. My mom was a teacher and um, Apparently, I was one of those older sisters who forced my siblings into playing school more often than they would have liked. So it was a natural fit. It was something that I could do. Um, but I think along the way, um, as someone else said, you know, I've been able to do a lot of reflection and, and have really developed some passions for certain aspects of the career. I've had a lot of experiences in different school settings. And for me, the one challenge that always seems apparent to me is the lack of attention to the relationships among colleagues or between colleagues and students or among leadership teams and, and teachers. And that's one of the most challenging aspects of the job, um, but also one of the most rewarding. So in my current role, I work in San Francisco at the French American International School as a curriculum coordinator in the elementary school. And in my current role, I'm, I'm really able to support teachers in what they teach and how they teach it. And I'm able to focus on this relationship build, building um, among staff members. And I think that's really important. So it's challenging, but it's also very rewarding. That's where I differ a little bit. I chose to take advantage of Tippy Valley's um, half-day college choice. So I would come to Tippy Valley till 11 o'clock each day, and then I would travel to a beauty college. And I actually would, after beauty college, go work and then start the next day over. So I had my diploma from beauty school before I actually had my diploma from Tippy Valley. Well, I started with an apprenticeship in Warsaw at the cutting edge. And after that, I moved to Rochester was married and had my first child, so I got a job at a salon there in Rochester, and I worked there for about a year and then switched to another salon for another year, and then decided to go out on my own and start my own business. And so now I own Sheer Image Salon, and I do hair full time. Actually, um, I think it was our senior year, we were given a test, and Tibby Valley provided that test, and it was if you, 
filled out this questionnaire, then it told you what you were good at. And I was going to do interior decorating, hairdressing, or I was going to be a nurse. And I couldn't do a nurse because I just don't like to see people sick <laughs> and care too much. So I decided hairdressing was good. I could be artistic and get to take care of people and make them feel good. I think the most challenging thing is taking care of every aspect of the business plus my family. Trying to balance time, schedules, I think I have four calendars. <laughs> it's very hard to manage everything and fit it all in one day. I like to work with my hands a lot. Uh, you know, I'm restoring my old house right now. I guess that keeps me occupied for every free minute that I have. Uh, I, the biggest volunteer uh, service that I do right now is uh, actually as part of the uh, technical rescue team for Huntington County. Um, so I dive and uh, do swift water rescue, things like that. A hobbies I enjoy, I'm an avid CrossFitter now. I also love snowboarding, cycling, and stand-up paddleboarding, along with uh, just hanging out with my friends outside of uh, the work environment. Uh, community service I've been involved in has been uh, with local churches as far as supplying meals to homeless and or uh, with local companies raising money for breast cancer research and other charities of the sort. I suppose my, my family is my hobby. I have two young guys at home, so we have a seven-year-old and an eight-year-old uh, two boys, and they keep us very busy with all sorts of things between um, being in Crimson Tide Aquatics and, and being in Cub Scouts and things like this. I'm also active in my um, um, church, and I'm not sure if that's a hobby. The, the two things that I do for myself, and you're going to get a kick out of this, one is shotgun sports. And so I, I'm quite a fan of low gun skeet and uh, sporting clays. And the, the other is I'm an uh, amateur weightlifter. <laughs> so, <laughs> I am active in the church. I'm a treasurer in, in uh, one of the Episcopal churches that I attend, and uh, we're, we're active in community service through that uh, organization. And so, um, uh, you know, that, that's a, another aspect of life that does provide balance for sure. Um, I go camping, do a lot of camping, not like hardcore camping, but fake camping uh, with my family in an RV with all the luxuries. Um, and I also have a service dog. She's a um, big joy of my life. And I do spend a lot of time with her, uh, taking her for walks and playing with her in the backyard and those kinds of things. Um, I also uh, like to listen to books on tape. And um, as um, boring as it might sound, I really enjoy just doing advocacy in my spare time too. So it's not uncommon for me to take off and go to a public hearing for fun. Yeah, I sit on a, a couple boards. Um, I sit on um, the Mobility Advisory Committee for Indigo, which is Indianapolis's uh, local transit system, um, and advise them on access issues uh, for uh, the city. Um, and I also sit on Indiana APSI, which is a not-for-profit that supports and promotes uh, supportive employment for uh, people with disabilities. I have two adult daughters and they're kind of out of the house, so my wife and I are enjoying just kind of being together by ourselves and doing that. Uh, I do have a, a geocaching hobby that I partake in, and I started uh, several years ago and I don't have time to do it a lot, but it's a lot of fun for me to get out and use the GPS to find uh, trivial trinkets that someone has left at, left at certain coordinates. It, it's a way to get some exercise. It's a way to get out and, and kind of be by myself and for, with a purpose. And I think that alone time has been very, very balancing for me. Right now, I, I'm not, I don't do as much as I used to. I, I think about uh, eight years ago, I was involved in a project where we uh, secured some funding to help uh, establish a mentoring program in our community, primarily for African American youths, but also those who are disadvantaged to some degree, to kind of pair them or partner them with uh, maybe a, a college student or, or someone who can kind of help be a guide through academic and personal struggles. And we were pretty successful in getting some initial funding, and then uh, we kind of helped 
roll that into an existing program to expand it uh, a little bit wider. One of the other projects I was involved with was helping uh, low-income families in our community get access to services that they qualified for but weren't aware for, of. And so it's a matter of making connections and kind of making sure that they are, are getting everything that they're entitled to and to make their lives a little bit better. Our sons, uh, now that they're both grown, we spend a lot of time with them down in Indianapolis, but I also enjoy uh, my church and the activities in my church and then gardening and traveling. Um, those are really the things that I do in my spare time. I've been on the Fulton County Leadership Academy since it started, um, and that's a great um, asset that we have here in Fulton County. And then I also am a member of the SIO Design Sorority where I serve as the cheese ball chairman, so they calls me, call me the cheese ball queen. But, um, and then FCA and um, the Girl Scouts, I've been involved with the Girl Scouts of Northern Indiana, Michigan too. Well, obviously travel's a big part of my life, so I've been to over 50 countries and I love to explore new places and meet new people and I've got friends all over the world. And it's, I nurture those relationships and that's important to me. Also, um, I like to stay healthy, so I exercise a lot, do yoga. Um, I love to hike and be out in nature. San Francisco's a good setting for that. Um, I also have a strong meditation practice and my spiritual life's important to me. Yeah, so I don't only practice yoga, but I also teach yoga twice a week in addition to my educational job. And it's very rewarding in the sense that you see people come in to class um, being stressed or uptight. And if they can leave my yoga class feeling relaxed and rejuvenated, I know I've done a good thing for people and I get a lot of uh, reward from that. Also, um, I was in Thailand during the year that the tsunami hit and our, my school, the school I was working with at the time, sponsored a local Thai school and um, started a foundation called After the Wave. And um, through After the Wave, I've supported um, a student, an orphaned student, um, and s funded his supplies and his tuition. I have a very active family. My children are all in sports. So we're usually coaching or on the sidelines cheering them on. And myself personally, I love to scrapbook and treasure the memories. Each of my children have a book for them that I will leave someday. And um, I just this year started getting to organics and composting and I started doing gardening. I planted an orchard and just kind of trying to start some new things. Actually, I love to volunteer. I don't say no very often. And so at our church, I, I sing and dance on stage and lead worship for children to merge the gap between children and their parents. They worship together in, in our setting. And then I also volunteer for Camp We Can in Rochester. I actually go in and spend a day pampering the mothers and give them back a little bit of what they do for their children every day. And every year our family sponsors another family in the local community and we let our children buy their Christmas gifts and things to show giving. I feel a lot of pride just going out there and doing my job. Uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty good feeling to hear the radio go off and, and know that you're going to go make a difference in somebody's life. So. The biggest sense of pride comes from knowing that I'm trying to do my part to serve my country as far as the accomplishments that I've had uh, I can't take sole credit for them because it's always been with the team and there's so many other people who've accomplished much greater things than I have. I, I've accomplished, I mean, I'll pat myself on the back. I've received lots of awards for research. I think probably the single biggest uh, achievement that I'm proudest of was in 2009 being named a fellow of the American Agricultural Economics Association. But if I had to name one thing that I'm proudest of, I think it's my family. That's certainly the sole source of my strength and sustenance. And beyond anything that I've achieved professionally, it has to be my family. Just really being able to make a difference in somebody's life. I had uh, the wonderful experience a couple years back. Uh, my uncle was going through a really difficult time in life. And I was able through, because I work in the field of social work, to 
um, provide him with some resources and things that uh, got him through those hard times. And um, my family has always been such a great support to me. And um, it felt really good to be able to finally give back to one of them. I'm involved with training future professionals. And for better or for worse, I'm, I'm often their mentor. And I think I hopefully teach them more good habits than bad habits. But just to kind of see them kind of parallel my path as far as making the same mistakes, but correcting them and not doing them again, learning new skills, that to me is, is uh, it makes me feel like I'm investing in the future. You know, every day it's wonderful to work with all these individuals who just care so much about our community and make a difference. Um, but for me, it's actually, um, as a working mom, to have um, raised two sons with servant hearts that love the Lord and are going to make a difference in their community. For me, it's the fact that I've always taken a risk or taken a chance when the opportunity has presented itself. People always say to me, oh, you're so brave to go to all those places to do all that traveling. How do you do that? And, you know, I really don't think about it like that. It just has been my life. And, you know, when an opportunity pr has presented itself, I just, I take it. And I think that's led to most of the things that I've been able to do. So I'm proud of that. My kids. <laughs> Anytime I get a compliment of their behavior, it just shows me that we're doing something right. Uh, well, something I learned at Valley, and that's kind of remained a trend uh, throughout my life, is uh, it, it takes a whole team of people um, to be successful. You know, you rely on other people all the time, uh, whether it's at work or in your personal life. Uh, so that's something I learned um, through sports, and uh, it's carried on. Yeah. Uh, the thing that I learned at Tippy Canoe Valley that helped me the most, uh, I actually learned on the wrestling mat here. Uh, was that if you give 100% of your effort, you'll eventually end up being successful. As a freshman, I uh, went 0-8 on the wrestling mat, so it was a perfect record of losing every match. And, uh, but I gave 100% for four years, and by my senior year, I was actually a decent wrestler. So that's where I learned that uh, giving 100% effort uh, can really help you accomplish your goals. And aside from Mr. Hinkle's algebra, uh, what would I have to put my finger on? And I'm going to give you a Hillary Clinton answer. Um, I think that as I thought about that, it wasn't one thing that I learned, and it wasn't even one thing that I learned at Tippecanoe Valley. I think it was actually what I learned growing up in a small farm rural community that was um, very well connected with each other. People cared a lot about each other. And um, in some respects, it was sort of bad. It was hard to get in trouble because if you went off and tried to do something, somebody you know, would see you that knew your parents. And so uh, uh, you'd be found out very quickly. But fun and joke aside, um, I think the biggest advantage I've had in life is just simply growing up here, learning the value of hard work, and understanding the strength and value of community. And that goes hand in hand with the school life, but it, it extends beyond that, I think, as well. You know, I think just that that small town uh, sense of community, it's followed me all through my life. Um, and that really very real sense of um, a responsibility to, you know, the fellow person beside you. Um, that's one of the great things about coming from, you know, a small farming con uh, community is you, you learn that sense of that gift of help. And, and you're not afraid to uh, reach out and help you know your neighbor over things. And you don't see that in a lot of parts of the world. So I think that's been uh, a really big gift that coming here has given me. The biggest thing I learned was not so much what I learned in the walls of the school, but it's what I learned from my friends and, and my social contacts. Uh, we all make mistakes, we all try on different behaviors and see what works and what doesn't. And my friends were really honest with me. If something didn't work, I heard about it. And, and if something did work, I got paid back with friendships and, and kind of long-term relationships. And I think what kind of set me on this path was the fact that I had uh, the same friends from kindergarten through 12th grade in the same classes and I could count on them, I could trust them, I could depend on them. They could do the same with me. And 35 years later, we're still pretty close. And so that, that was probably the best thing that could have happened. I, I think it's our small town communities and just how we all care for each other and 
when we came out to Tippecanoe Valley, being the newest uh, students, you, there was this sense of not knowing. Even though we knew Mentone people, we really didn't know. We hadn't spent much time, but it didn't take us long to come together and mesh. So I think just the opportunity to grow up in a small town and understand commu small community life and taking care of each other. Yeah, others have talked about this, so my answer is similar. Um, but I would say integrity and authenticity, and it expands past the school walls of the high school. Um, beginning with my family, you know, I believe my parents are certainly models of integrity and authenticity, and um, that's also reflective of the community that we grew up in. You know, I've I've traveled a lot, but I always take Akron with me in my heart, and I always come home. And there's a, uh, something about being from a small town that um, not everybody has that experience. And um, it's really benefited me to have that and to take that with me everywhere that I go. So I think integrity and authenticity. I think high school was a reality check for me. It brought a lot of um, light to, you know, to study and things. I think life is what you make of it, and kind of like some have said before, it's every opportunity you're given, it's how you take it and what you do with it. I would say to current students, um, don't be afraid to do something extraordinary, you know, there's something out of the ordinary. Uh, don't be afraid to get outside of your comfort zone every once in a while. and. Uh, Definitely don't be afraid to challenge yourself. A uh, piece of advice that I'd share with Tippecanoe Valley students is the sky's the limit for them and that they will choose their own level of success, but along the way that it's the people they associate with well, that will either help them achieve their goals or will keep them from achieving their goals. So if you want to be successful, I really believe you have to hang out with successful people. And if you hang out with people who don't want to be successful, then you will not be successful either. No, there, there would be two things I think I would say. And I tried to say it maybe not all at the same time, but in various ways to the groups I met with this morning. It would be two things. One is never stop being a student. Just because you graduate from high school, maybe even just because you go into college, you have to be a student the rest of your life. Things change, technology changes, uh, the world around us is changing at a high rate of speed. And I think that everybody has to be prepared to be an active student. Uh, the other thing that I would s sort of say is don't be scared to fail. Don't be scared to try something and not have it work out, that's fine. Failure is not a problem. I've learned way more from my mistakes in life, perhaps, than I have from my successes and achievements. And so I think sometimes that we get caught up in the idea that it's an embarrassment to fail, and if we'll try something new or try something different and it doesn't work out, oh, that it will be a shame, but I think not. Life is about, you know, 10% uh, what actually happens to you, and, you know, 90% how you react to it. Uh, we all have challenges. Um, some of our challenges are very visual ones that you can see, and others aren't so visible, but um, their challenge is just the same. But they don't have to keep you from accomplishing your goals and your dreams. I think I'm a good example of uh, not really knowing at the outset what I wanted to do, but finding out what fit with me simply by taking steps that I thought were in the right direction. And so I think my life is a series of, of, of accomplished steps. Sometimes my steps weren't extremely well placed, but I still uh, was able to move forward a little bit. So I guess what I would suggest is that uh, always have a next step in mind, whether it's uh, bettering yourself in an occupational setting or more education or working, doing something in the community or something to better your family. If there's always a next step, then, then as someone said earlier, you're not, you're not uh, stopping your growth. And there's always something to work toward, which I think gives you motivation to do your best. So always have a next step in mind. I didn't really know what I was going to, well, I thought I knew what I was going to do, but I changed my mind in March of my senior year. And it was because I actually realized that I had a gift for accounting. And that just changed my life. And we all have gifts. God gives us gifts, and if you find out what that skill or that talent is and you use it, whether it be to serve others or in your career, it, it just makes life more enjoyable because every day you wake up and you want to do what you, you, know, what you set out to do. 
So I'd say, you know, work hard and find that gift. I, I think this is an exciting time to be a kid, you know, to be a high school student. This generation has lots of opportunities. And I would say, don't be afraid to explore the world around you, whether it be close to home or far away. You know, if you have an opportunity, take it. Um, be curious, ask questions. Um, don't be afraid to keep learning. Um, put yourself out there and you'll be rewarded for it. All through high school, I strived to try to find myself. So I think my biggest advice for these kids is be content with who they are and really figure out what they want to do with their lives. Failure is not an option. If you learn along the way, you've grown as a person. And just to always try to strive to do better for yourself.